Good morning. Good morning. As you're settling in there, I'll just start talking so you don't have to pay all attention to me, but good morning and, and welcome to our first lecture of the Women's Society of Washington University. It's entitled Education and Equity, Moving Past Surviving into Thriving. And I am Angie Bernardi, and I have the honor of being the Women's Society president this year. I wanna thank you all for taking the time to join us in person and also live stream. We're grateful for the technology to be able to offer these hybrid meetings. For more than 55 years, the Women's Society has supported academic and leadership opportunities for our Washington University students. Due to the generosity of our membership, the Women's Society funds student projects, leadership awards, and two full tuition scholarships for students who attend St. Louis Community College to come to Washington University, the Elizabeth Gray Danforth Scholarship. We're proud partners in supporting students and bringing to life Chancellor Martin's vision for Washington University to be in St. Louis and for St. Louis. We're a group of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds who are interested in supporting the university and appreciate the valuable asset it is to our community. Many of you are members of our Women's Society, but for those of you who are not, I don't wanna miss the opportunity to invite you to join us. Membership in the Women's Society will allow you to enjoy these opportunities to gather and attend all of our lectures in the series featuring our prominent faculty members and WashU community members. And if you go to our Women's Society website, I learned today that you can find out about those lectures, register, and also join us. So please visit. Since we were created to bring the community to the university, I want to welcome our community this morning, and I hope you enjoy the program. Now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Aixa Martinez, the chair of our education series. And I'm grateful for her leadership and the work of the committee to put together this amazing series. And she will introduce our speaker. Welcome, Aixa. Thank you, Angie, and good morning to all of you joining us today. I am Aixa Martinez, and I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Nikki Dowdy. Nikki joined the Institute for School Partnership at Washington University as Associate Director of Strategic Initiatives in 2021, after 15 years at City Academy. City Academy is an independent private school located in North St. Louis City that provides 100% of their families with significant scholarship support. Nikki most recently served as Chief Operating Officer of City Academy and previously as Assistant Director of Development and Director of Admissions and Placement. During her tenure at City Academy, Nikki helped to advance the school's commitment to transforming children, families, and communities through the exceptional education and bold expectations that empower children to overcome barriers. Committed to equity and social justice, Nikki's work has centered on access and opportunity for our most undervalued communities. During her first year at the Institute for School, School Part Partnership, she has worked closely with community partners to support efforts within schools to bolster programs through a unique design approach that is strength-based and human-centered. Nikki earned her bachelor's degree from University of Missouri-St. Louis and Master of Arts in International Relations from Webster University. She's also earned a Master of Social Work here at the Brown School. In 2017, she was recognized with the Distinguished Alumni Award from the Brown School for her commitment and passion for improving the lives of children, families, and organizations so our communities can be healthy and thriving. Washington University and the Institute for Schools Partnership are fortunate to benefit from her expertise, and we are grateful to have her here today. Please join me in welcoming Nikki Dowdy. Good morning, everyone. It is so awesome to be here. Um, as a previous um, Women's Society board member, I um, feel really honored that I get to come back and do 
and be part of this organization um, that I care very deeply about. So uh, I also just wanna thank you for showing up today. Um, I'm so grateful that we're able to be here together in this very hybrid approach as things get back to, um, we call it a new normal, not the old normal. I think that's, uh, that's gone. Um, but also just recognizing um, your longstanding, our longstanding commitment to champion Washington University. Many of you share my pride in the impact that we have internationally, nationally, and right here in this region. The university's moniker, as you just heard, in St. Louis for St. Louis. And I'm so thrilled to share with you the many, many ways that the ISP shows up in this space. I think it's really important to just take a moment to acknowledge again um, that we're here gathered, um, not only in person, but across um, our screen. So hello to you all who are joining us um, through Zoom. Um, navigating the challenges presented by the pandemic impacted our community in ways that we could have never imagined. There was simply no sector immune to the impact of COVID and will likely live with this aftermath into the next generation. It's my hope that we've learned a number of things about our capacity to not simply survive, but to thrive. So before we get started, I want you to take a second. Um, you're gonna hear a little bit from me. I don't want you to hear always from me, um, but I wanna hear from you why you came today. What are you wondering and why you're showing up to hang out with me? So I'm gonna give you 30 seconds because I'm putting you on the spot and then I'm gonna call on some folks. Oh, you are ready to go. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me your name and why you're here today? Hi, Evelyn. Oh, that's fantastic. Right. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate you being here. And we'll circle back to some of the things you've just mentioned later on today or this morning. I won't keep you that long. <laughs> All right. I would love to hear some more. I'd love to know who I'm with today. So I will tell you that today we'll talk a bit about, we'll be framing. I think it's really important for um, us to start the conversation in the same place, which is understanding where um, our economic or social and education system sits right now and what's happening for our communities. And then I'll move into some of the pieces that the ISP has implemented in our partnerships across St. Louis to really um, address the disparities that you're talking about. One of the things we often talk about, though, is that this is a solution. It's not the only solution. And one of the things that makes it beautiful to be in partnership across the region with fantastic St. Louis partners is that there are lots of people doing really good work. And we have a corner of this space where we want to just show you the kind of good work we're doing in the St. Louis community. So I'm hopeful that we can provide you with just some, um, some nuggets of what that looks like in practice and the impact that's happening for us and our, for our kiddos. Yes, ma'am. Judith Meyer, I chair the board of a set of charter schools in South St. Louis. Our executive director, Miranda Ming, is sitting next to me. And we're here to 
explore to hear what you're doing and see how you can connect with us. And I love that. Do our job. <laughs> yes. Hi, Sydney. I'm Sydney Lofgren Wolf, and I've heard about you through our mutual friend Beth Herzig, who is here today. And uh, I just heard that you're doing really innovative things, that you've had great success at a pretty rapid clip. So I'm really excited to hear about how you've accomplished all of that, um, if there's a plan to roll it out on a larger scale. And then, of course, also just some, I don't know, information from my own learning about why this early you know, intervention and, and education is important and what kind of results sure. we can see through that versus a later intervention. Okay. And um you know, I'm a big believer, like another member said earlier, we've got to make a difference sooner in order to equalize, level the playing field for everybody and give everybody opportunity. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Oh We're my excited. gosh. Thank you for being here today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jane Brown, and actually I'm an alumni of Washington University. And I am here because of an invitation from a mutual friend. And just education has always been the um, just epitome of anything that you ever hope to do. Education has got to be the base. Mm -hmm. And based on this topic, I thought, well, I'm bound to get some good information and something that I can take back that will be uh, helpful to our younger people. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here. You didn't know you were getting your workout in today. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Suzanne Franza Valdez, and I'm fascinated with the uh, program this morning, but I've been a member of this amazing organization for a number of years. Uh, so it's wonderful to have you as the presenter today. But since you were asking about who we are and what we're engaged with. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm a volunteer at uh, Loyola Academy. You're smiling. Huge fan, yes. We did a lot of cross work with them and Eric is a dear friend, so okay. wonderful school. Mm -hmm. I'll have to go back and tell him that <laughs> tell I have an opportunity to hear you today, <laughs> right. But uh, my most recent role there has been, and I'm saying this because I'm hoping to maybe elicit a few volunteers, but we have an amazing library at Loyola in middle school boys, uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And uh, about five years ago, I thought, gosh, this library could use some real help um, in advancing to the library that would be very specific to this group of students. So we're working on that. Uh, but we're also looking for somebody who might be interested in being a librarian. <laughs> so just to say, ladies, if any of you have a, uh, history of background in library work, we could really use your assistance at Loyola Academy. So that's wonderful. Will you um, <clears throat> please, can we talk afterwards? Um, City Academy's uh, director of library science um, is incredible. And she has transformed City Academy's library into a state-of-the-art multimedia and also research space for our students. Um, and I think that she could be very helpful in providing resources. So I'd love to just get you guys connected. I, I will definitely talk with you. Thank you so much. Okay, definitely. We'll take one more person. <laughs> I'm sorry, ma'am, who are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a guest at Kathleen Cameron's um, this morning. Um, but I guess first and foremost, I. I'm the executive director of AIM High St. Louis, which is a, um, a middle school program for underrepresented, very motivated uh, middle schoolers. And I also chair the board of the St. Louis Public Schools Foundation, and I run the international school, the international program at John Burroughs School. So educational equity is kind of my jam. So that's why I'm here and to support Nikki. It's good to see you. All right. So I think that um, what I'm going to talk about today should hit on a lot of the things that you have, you've mentioned. I also i am going to throw a lot of things at you. I want you to sit in the information. And at the second half of um, this morning, I would love to engage in a conversation. Education is not a single street of communication. That's how we used to teach. It is not how effective teaching it does. It's not what it looks like today. And so as we move from learning, I love to move 
into engagement and listen to the things that you were wondering about and figuring out how we might be able to provide you with some information on how to help all of us move this really important work forward. So in the education sector, we're asked to accept a post-pandemic narrative that places blame for any and all challenges schools face squarely on the shoulders of the pandemic. Those of us who have been closer to the work for a longer time, teachers, administrators, those folks, us boots closest to the ground, will tell you that is not the case. As painful as COVID was, it barely laid claims to what has been happening and what's been plaguing our school systems for decades. It's important that we acknowledge some facts and then we do some reframing that allows us to see these facts and breed benefit to context. We have a significant teacher shortage. This is so very true right now, very real reality facing our St. Louis community. St. Louis public schools are trying to fill 113 teaching vacancies. Throughout the region, districts report that high school science and math, foreign language and special education are especially difficult to find. The shortage reflects not only those leaving the profession, but also a limited pool of qualified applicants coming in. The mass exodus and lack of deep bench waiting in the wings are most certainly exacerbated by the pandemic, but the root causes have long been in the making. How do we know? Because teachers tell us. In a Missouri State Teachers Association survey conducted last year, almost half of Missouri's teachers said they often consider leaving the profession, citing student behavior, substitute teacher shortages as the main stressors. In that same survey, pay is cited as the top reason Missouri teachers leave the profession. Missouri ranks 50th in the nation for starting salaries. While a shortage of substitute teachers could directly correlate to the pandemic, issues as complex as student behavior and low teacher pay have been brewing. There's been decreased student achievement, especially among our underserved communities. Of course, this is true. We've all heard these conversations. We've read this in anything that pops up in news, Twitter, social media. And a September article in the Times reported that national tests indicating how devastating the last two years have been for our nine-year-olds, especially those most vulnerable. This year, for the first time since the National Assessment of Education Progress test began tracking student achievement, um, nine-year-olds lost ground in math and in scores and reading fell by the largest margin in more than 30 years. So I want you to sit in that for a second. We are facing a devastating teacher shortage. Our children are facing the largest gap in achievement than we have seen in decades. And so we all came back to school in person and all of these things are supposed to be resolved for, or we in schools are supposed to fix that. And while declines spanned all races and income levels with more significant drops for the lowest performing students, in math, black students lost 13 points compared with five points among white students, widening the gap between the two groups. The Times article cites research documenting the profound effect school closures had on low income students and on black and Hispanic students, in part because their schools were more likely to continue remote learning for much longer periods of time. It's important to remember that students living in communities served by under-resourced schools have long been complex at a complex disadvantage well, well before the pandemic. Most don't have access to technology or internet access at home, and their schools are also struggling to provide this. Often teachers may have access to those devices at school, but they don't have access to any devices when they go home. Orlando Sharp, a longtime ISP friend and an area STEM educator frames the challenge like this. Technology is no longer special. It's an everyday tool, a reality. Most educators and students in underserved schools have become accustomed to finding workarounds rather than just having the resources they need from the very beginning of the school day. On one hand, that does lead to creativity by necessity, but it also generates anxiety that just doesn't need to be there. Addressing those everyday inequities that have become the norm for too many teachers, schools, and students is at the core of the work that the Institute for School Partnership does. And we've been doing it for 30 years. 
The part of our name we claim um, the most important is the P for partnership. There we go. The ISP was founded in the late 80s by WashU biology professor, Sarah Sally Elgin. Early in her career, Elgin was already pushing against an inequitable system. She was thrown out of several classes because she asked too many questions. It is this spirit that helped to establish our organization. The program initially brought the university science faculty into UCD schools to provide students with an interactive environmental science and genetics projects. By 1990, the initial partnership had expanded and led by our incredible executive director, Victoria May. And for more than 20 years, she has been able to create this incredible organization, one that Washington University calls its signature program to strategically improve teaching and learning within the K through 12 education community. Thanks to leadership from Sally and Vicki and hundreds of committed WashU faculty who've been generous with their time and talent and shared belief that WashU's, WashU has a critical role to play beyond the campus. IS, the ISP is involved in one of the nation's largest initiatives to improve the quality of science and math for all students. So let's get into how we do this. The ISP program reaches more than 2,500 teachers, 400 administrators, and over 150,000 students each year. Our focus is on the school and teacher leadership, development of engaging STEM, instructional materials and programs, and strategic university school partnerships for increased student achievement. Let's take a moment to circle back to that P word because it's essential to the work we do. So our partnership. The instructional specialists who support teaching teams working in schools across our region bring years of classroom experience and deep content knowledge, but they also bring something our schools and our teachers and administrators deserve, respect. The ISP recognizes that teachers and school leaders are the ones who know the schools, the culture, the families, and the students best. They understand the strengths and the challenges. We do not come in with prescribed research and say, this is what you need to be doing. We come in and we ask you, what do you dream? What do you vision? And what are your strengths to help you propel that vision into actual actuality and reality? So we do that through what we call our human-centered and strengths-based approach. It's a highly collaborative practice that utilizes asset-based thinking that center people at the heart of reimagining what's possible and then working together to implement and test out new strategies. This highly collaborative process focuses on the strengths people and organizations already have to elevate their work. This framework fosters long-term strategy with a focus on immediate actionable steps and measurable impact. So I'd love to take this time to share with you what comes to life every day and what our partnerships and programs look like so that we can become a hub, that we are a hub of innovation. So our first one is our investigation stations, igniting the kind of curiosity that encourages young people to start seeing themselves as scientists, engineers, mathematicians has long been our priority. Children learn by using their senses. What can they observe? What can they touch, hear, see, smell? One of the best ways to reach all children with early um, introductions to the wonder and joy of science is to go to them. For many years, the ISP took a hands-on science exploration fund to communities across the region with our investigation stations. This mobile learning lab, they're outfitted with books, kid-friendly models, and manipulatives. They even have caves where many young St. Louisans first learned about stalactites and stalagmites. To ensure that we're reaching the most under-resourced communities in need um, of this early childhood STEM learning experience, we've recently patched the torch and the vans to the Urban League of Metro St. Louis, um, their Head Start program, an organization which proudly serves the broader community with high quality programs. We are so excited the investigation stations have a new steward who will help ignite early STEM learning. We also have our MySci program, which is dedicated to making science engaging for young leaders. 
delivering standards aligned science curriculum that inspires curiosity and spurs young leader learners to start thinking of themselves as scientists is no small tasks, task, especially for our elementary school teachers who are responsible for teaching all of the subject areas. The MySci program is designed to remove the burden for teachers and districts. K through eight teachers throughout the region count on the program to supply a continually updated high quality science curriculum coupled with hands-on science, um, science learning kits. The kits come in signature red containers, providing teachers everything they need. The ISP manages everything from kit fulfillment to delivery, pickup, and refurbishment each year. So we are serving thousands of MySci kits across the districts, um, across 50 districts, um, and just right here in University City. In 2001-2002, we, um, we were working with 305 public, private, independent, and parochial schools, supporting 3,800 teachers and inspiring 125,000 students. The program is bolstered with high quality professional development designed to meet individual school districts needs and to create opportunities for teachers to network and deepen their knowledge of the MySci resources. Next up, we have um, our STEM PACT program. STEM science, technology, engineering is everywhere. Um, in Missouri and Illinois, three out of four of our fastest growing occupations are in STEM fields, but we have a problem. Business leaders cannot find the talent to supply the demand. That's the core message of SEMPACT. Our innovative and proven program administered by the ISP designed to equip teachers and prepare area students for STEM success. Founded with the belief that education is key to meet the growing STEM demand. SEMPACT is a unique collaborative approach that combines the resources and human capital of major corporations and foundations, local schools and districts and Washington University. And the goal to guarantee that all children can participate in educational programs that expand their economic opportunities and equip them as future leaders in our community. SEMPAC does this in a few critical ways that I'd love to share for you today. The first is STEM teacher quality, which we call STEM TQ. It's a year long immersive professional development opportunity to equip teachers to become STEM competent with strategies to integrate STEM across subject areas. Each STEM TQ cohort begins with a summer institute to full weeks of nonstop immersive STEM learning packed with guided field trips to some of the area's most STEM rich locations, Castlewood State Park, Victory um, uh, Lanes Raceway, MasterCard, Millipore Sigma, and the St. Louis Zoo. Teachers and facilitators of each cohort also meet monthly throughout the school year for added um, enrichment activities. This, su this summer, the 10th STEM TQ cohort launched. Since 2011, STEM TQ Institute has reached over 1,000 teachers, impacting over 35,000 students and counting. The second essential STEM PAC component is STEM PAC District Immersion, or what we call STEM DI. STEMDI is a program for selected districts focuses um, collaboratively at the classroom level. The, co the current cohort is Melville, Rittner, and Maplewood, Richmond Heights. With support from ISP, teachers and leaders from those districts have formed what we call a network improvement community aimed at improving math learning. In 2001-2002, this cohort included 32 teachers, math coaches, and administrators from these districts. We have what we also call Math 314. This STEM DI cohort has chosen to focus on math instruction. And um, these teachers, math coaches, and administrators are leaning into um, this ISP program of Math 314. But before I tell you about the program, I'm going to take a quick poll. And I'd like for you to raise your hand. I met an accountant earlier, so I know this answer to this question for her. Raise your hand if you like think of yourself as good at math. He would say, I'm really good at that. Now take a look around, see the community of right hands you got. Now I'd like you to take a look around and for those of you who would say, oh, no, 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 I'm real bad at math. Raise your hand. I like you got some people in the middle. <laughs> well, whichever camp you're in, this is what we call math identity. Young learners start identifying themselves as good or bad at math by third or fourth grade. 
Think about your own math learning experience. Did you merely memorize or did you understand? The goal of Math 314 is to equip teachers with skills that invite every student to engage. The program supports teachers to become both learners and leaders who encourage risk-taking and welcome more than one path to the correct answer and understanding. To do this, teachers often find themselves reckoning with their own math identities. They do this by asking lots of questions and presenting it to students something more complex than a math problem on the board. They present high level tasks that require a higher level of cognitive demand and encourage creative thinking. Rachel Thomas, a middle school teacher in the Rittner School District is delighted with what's happening in her classroom as she's embraced support from ISP math specialists. She says, the kids are authentically on board. I have the pleasure of watching them grow, challenge their own misconceptions and use mathematical and educational vocabulary to articulate how they arrive at an answer. Sometimes I'm so excited I have to stop and record what's happening with my camera. This opportunity with the ISP came at the right time in my career. It's exactly what I wanted for myself and for my students. Math 314 provides a number of professional development opportunities as we help educators discover ways to nurture equitable math learning environments embedded in individual coaching, learning labs, resources, and evaluation support. As you can see, these hands-on partnerships are directly connected to what's happening in the classrooms. We have two other programs that are focused on the more macro approach to design, where we look at the entire school system. SLPS Principal Redesign, SLPS St. Louis Public School, um, is a, a, the Principal Redesign focuses on school leadership. So a primary example of this is the SLPS Redesign Program, which um, takes this human-centered approach and helps each of the principals reimagine and redesign their schools. It's been incredible to work with some fabulous leaders to help them embrace innovation as they design new visions for their schools with a strengths-based leadership approach and a human-centered design process. We have several cohorts that we're working with, um, Alamphy Botanical, Roosevelt High School, Vashon High School, Shenandoah, Pierre Laclede, Woodward Elementary, and Carver Elementary. What makes this pro process incredible is that schools are moving from this deficit-based approach to problem solving, to saying what strengths do we have in our community that will allow us to actualize our new vision and purpose. One of the, um, a really great example of this is Carver Elementary. Brandon, principal, came in and one of the, we asked what you, you know, what are you wondering? What are you hopeful for, for your school year? And when Brandon came in, he said, you know, remote learning has had a devastating impact on the school community, on our students and engagement. Um, and I said, okay, well, in our inquiry-based approach, we ask what's working. There are so many strengths within our schools, what's working? And so he went back to his school and he talked to his teachers and what they elevated was in fifth grade, they noticed that they had high attendance for the longest, most consistent amount of time during um, remote learning. So using the inquiry-based approach, he went to the teacher and he said, what were you doing in your classroom where you didn't experience the same drop off in attendance um, as the, others, uh, the, um, the other classrooms? And she said, well, I'm not sure what I was doing, but this is what I did. This is what we were doing in my classroom. And what happened were what she was doing was focused on relationship building. Every morning, whether they were on Zoom or on campus, they would have breakfast together. And it would not, there would not be, and there wasn't an academic focus. It was just check in. How are you doing? Tell me a funny joke. What's happening at home? This is what's happening for me. And what she realized, or what Brandon realized, was that she was building this really rich connection with her students, but the students were building rich connections to other, others. And what they were realizing was that they wanted to be in that community because they were getting love, warmth, and nurture in that community. And so Brandon took that piece and said, what do I create that takes those concepts and makes it part of the culture and the norms for our whole school? So the design process helps him create what we call prototypes. We, create a, we take that small piece that happened just in this one fifth grade classroom and we test it out with another classroom. And then we learn from that, we get feedback from that, from teachers, from students, 
um, from actually what happens when we take that prototype and put it into implementation. And what ended up happening towards the end of last year was Brandon created for Carver a Harry Potter house system that now spans the entire part of the school, which it harnesses those cultures, those pieces um, of the classroom, not just now experienced in fifth grade, but also is an experience for the whole school. And so where one, for the school, for the students, it's about showing up and being in a place where they feel love, value, and seen. And for the district and outcomes, it's about increased attendance, more students in seats when the time school starts, student engagement, and now being connected directly to their teacher and their classmates in ways that they weren't experiencing before. That's just one of the examples. There are seven other that we're working on. The second year of the cohort, we're moving into implementation and prototyping other designs um, to help advance the work of each of the schools. The other systems-based approach we have is um, TLI, or what is Transformational Leadership Initiative. It's an ambitious multi-year effort designed to improve academic um, performance and overall learning environments for students throughout the St. Louis region. This process, the program also builds a capacity of faculty and administrators to transform their organizations with a human-centered approach to leadership. For this first cohort, we're working directly with SLPS elementary schools. We have Ashland and Merrimack. Both have been identified as schools that could benefit greatly from a really bold, innovative, strength-based approach aimed at accelerating student learning. Both schools have been given leeway to operate under a unique set of conditions that put critical education decisions in the hands of teachers and school leaders. So we're taking the decisions from the district level and everything that's happening at Merrimack and Ashland is happening th with those closest to the students and the families in the decision-making seat. We partner directly with um, the executive director, Jay Hartman on this serving, he serves as the administrator, peer educator, facilitator, convener in chief, cheerleader and coach. It's been so transformative to be part of helping leaders in these schools take on new kinds of ownership and autonomy. As we head into our third and final year with this cohort, these schools are embracing a place-based learning model. Place-based learning engages students in their communities, drawing on the physical environments, local cultures and history and people to enhance deeper classroom learning. PBL invites families and communities into the school and, and, the heart, and place them at the heart of the education process. Jay says, families want to see their community as an asset to their kids, learning, not a deficit. Innovative solutions like this can change the entire narrative of a school, but not just the school, the neighborhood. Long-term, this invites communities to reclaim ownership of what's happening in their school down the street, their school. And let's not forget the teachers. The teachers are at the heart of TLI. They are the ones with a really powerful message of respect and invitation to have a voice cannot be under, um, under us understated. Brittany Stevens is one of the emerging leaders from the program, a kindergarten teacher with more than 13 years of classroom experience. Brittany joined the staff at Ashland about a year ago. It's been so exciting to watch her emerge as a leader, to see her gain confidence, to claim what she knows and knows best about her students. Brittany says, We've been given the freedom to actually examine what our students might need and the liberty to do what we know is best for them. When asked about her role as an empowered teacher, it's, more, it's much more than just teaching the curriculum. You have to know your students. You have to look at the whole child. You have to know what they need and fill in those gaps. How do you talk with them? How do you make them feel safe? If they need love, lead with love. Imagine what we can do when teachers who say something as powerful as this are given the voice and the vote and closest to the decision making on what happens in their classrooms and in their schools. These are just nuggets of the work that we do. Thank you so much for letting me chat with you about this work and what we've been doing. For us, educational excellence um, is really spirited by this human centered approach and a strength-based approach. Schools and systems have capacity. And when we allow them to lead and when we allow teachers to be the voice behind those decisions, really great things can happen. 
And to ensure this together, you guys have been here, you've shown up today to hear how we can do this. We need to ensure that WashU's commitment to diversity, innovation, and leadership continues to be shared with abundance to the St. Louis region. So as we talk today, as we learn from each other today, know that when you leave here, you take what you've learned and your experience out into the broader community to really help elevate the work of everything we're doing to help support our students and our school communities. Now I'd love to hear from you and answer any questions you might have about any of the programs and also the education landscape. Thank you. I think we have a mic coming around. I can hear it, I'll repeat. Oh. <laughs> build this um, teacher shortage? Is anything being done? That so I'm going to give you, there's a lot being done. I will tell you that there's a couple of bills um, in the General Assembly, and I could be wrong, so someone correct me if it's passed, to shift the certification requirements for teachers in classrooms. So not to get into the weeds, but um, uh, how schools are funded, have there are pieces that are connected to having a certified teacher in a classroom. When that there is not a certified teacher in a classroom, those are hours that students are not with that teacher and that directly impacts budget. And so there's conversation around what um, certification looks like, how to increase the pool of teachers that can be qualified, but maybe not certified or certified, but changing what those qualifications are. Those are some of the pieces that are happening. And I, does someone else also know things are happening in Yeah. Thank you, Tammy. That's great. Oh, sure. Oh, one real quick. We need a mic so the folks on Zoom can hear us. Thanks, guys. I have two unrelated questions. Um, it sounds like it's mostly STEM focused. Are you guys doing anything with English and sort of the humanity side of learning for students as well? Or are there plans to if there are not currently initiatives of those in, the, in the, of that manner? Sure. And then the other question, I'm not sure how to articulate this, but my understanding is with public schools, there are certain requirements that they have uh, to remain sort of, you know, I don't know, certified to be public accredited mm -hmm. in terms of how they teach, what they teach, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How it seems like you're bringing a lot of innovation, needed innovation, but how are you working with that, uh, with the public school community to make sure that you kind of stay within whatever requisite guidelines they have, yeah. um, but sort of help them move forward, innovate, make progress, make change? Those are great questions. So the first part of your question is um, that the majority of our work within the classrooms, all of our work in the classrooms is STEM focused. That's the mission of the ISP is to, um, to make sure that every single child in the region has really strong and rich access to math and science classroom instruction. Um, but, or not but, and um, the macro level work that we're doing, so TLI, the transformational leadership um, work that we're doing at Merrimack and Ashland, um, and also the work that we are doing in the SLPS redesign, that is not just STEM focus. That is looking at the whole of the school. So for Ashland, theirs is very much focused on both Ashland and, um, and Merrimack are looking at place-based learning and looking at how to, to um, increase the performance in reading. Our work is to help support, provide resources and uh, materials and also expertise on changing or helping them take what they have and creating a new system in which their whole school operates including strengthening instructional coaching and curriculum. And that happens with having other supports in the classroom with them while also supporting the redesign of their whole school. So those are pieces, yes, and um, there's the STEM focus, but then we're also very much interested in this macro level support of schools. And your second question sort of leads into that. 
that's where the partnership come, comes from. So we can help. We have incredible instructional specialists who are brilliant at curriculum design. And so what we do is build out programming that is aligned with what the standards are, but helps to, to elevate how and what instruction looks like so that students are really at the center of instruction and classroom um, learning, but, that the le but what they have to teach, what the outcomes look like are aligned with state standards and district standards. Um, so that's why the partnership is so important. It's also why we have multi-year partnerships. The first part of all of our partnerships really get um, are in that, that human-centered strengths-based approach. We ask lots of questions for a year. We are embedded in the school, listening, seeing what's happening, talking with teachers, talking with administrators. And then together with our partners, we formulate what the next two years look like. And you move from design into implementation and then continue to monitor and support as um, the school evolves in that new process or in that new space. Yes. Oh, we have a one second. I can also repeat. You can go ahead. I can repeat. I do. My children attend public schools in the city. And what I've uh, witnessed uh, for charter schools specifically is that although the student population is very, very diverse, the teaching faculty and staff are not. And so can you talk about how we can open more pathways for students to see leaders in education who look like them? And we really appreciate all of your work at ISP. My own children have benefited, but also because I uh, work with alumni from the engineering department and they really wanna see more students see a pathway to careers in engineering. Sure. And then that department also is focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you. Um, I think the short answer to that is, or the not short answer, but the, the more immediate way to resolve that is we need to think differently about how we are um, recruiting and building um, relationships with a broad scope of the community so that we can attract a really diverse um, teacher population. Um, our response to that is that it actually starts much, much younger. We said math identity is in third grade. And if by, if by third grade, you've decided you are no longer, that math and science is not your thing, it's gonna be really hard to convince you to go into math and science as a profession. And so that's where STEM PACT and STEM DI and STEM TQ really focus on instilling, providing teachers with the resources to create rich, fun, engaging, um, learning environments so that in kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth grade, students are having, are, are finding success and also experiencing um, learning that failure is a part of what it means to learn and to engage in that higher, um, higher thinking, um, cognitive thinking work so that as they're navigating through elementary and into high school, science and math are as loved for them as any other um, subject area, which in increases their desire to go into that into undergrad and then will allow us to attract a much more diverse group of, um, of up and coming teachers interested in coming into the classroom. Oh, yes. Hi, I had um, a similar question. I was curious if you had a partnership with the state education department and if you shared any of your curriculum and ideas with, with folks in Jefferson City. So we don't have direct impact with policy. Our work is really to be um, directly connected with districts and schools. Um, we don't work heavily with um, um, the state in a way that's like there's impact that way. We do though, um, you know, because we have uh, Hawthorne and um, KIPP, our charters that the university sponsors work very closely to, um, you know, as policies are being written, as things come up, up for, not vote, but are being considered and the General Assembly, those are spaces that we are in um, to provide insight and um, resources and research. So that in that way, I think that is a much more like linear um, conversation. How are you funded? Are you supported completely by WashU? <laughs> um, so, no. Um, we have incredible supports. So the bulk of our, our funding comes from external resources. Um, 
corporations and foundations um, heavily support the work of the ISP. Um, Beth, where's Beth? Our fearless leader. Um, we just, we need to, yes, please give Beth all of them. <laughs> um, we, you know, we have really incredible support from the um, philanthropic community here in St. Louis, but we also um, are, we need to diversify our funding. As you can see, the landscape, the market shifts, and when a company leaves or shifts their priorities, that directly impacts the ISP. And so Beth is helping us create for the first time an annual giving um, uh, uh, campaign and fund so that we can have more consistent and reliable funding to support the work that we do. As I mentioned before, everything we do is multi-year partnerships. We're not coming into a school and leaving the next year. We understand that true change, true transformative change takes time. And we have to be there for prototypes to get tested and to learn from them and then to create another iteration of that. And that doesn't happen within one school year. And so for us, we wanna build connections and build an annual fund that can allow us to create a more stable funding stream that will support all of the programs that you've seen here um, for you know decades at a time. Kind of in the same vein, I was wondering, uh, do the schools or the districts have to put any kind of financial uh, portion into this training program, or is it all provided? And then secondly, you have a long list of schools and districts that are on a waiting list to get involved with you. That's a great and question. How do you sort through that? Um, so right now we are currently in 50 districts. Um, in the area. We are at capacity. We would love to work with other districts, um, but right now we just don't have the staff. Because our instructional specialists, we don't just come in and drop off a kit. They're embedded in the classroom, really working to provide feedback and support to teachers. They're also modeling class lessons. So they'll come in and do a lesson with a teacher so the teacher can see what that looks like. Um, so to do that at the scale, that we have, we do over 3000 teachers. Um, we just don't have that capacity. Um, what I would say is that the work that some of these pieces like my sci school districts do pay for, um, but that is not across the board. So there's significant programming that we do provide that is on the cost of the ISP that's gifted to the ISP. TLI um, is one of those, so is the SLPS redesign is one of those that is um, funded by the Institute for School Partnership. And there's other pieces of the other programs that you've seen, the um, investigation stations, the support, the partnership with um, the Urban League Head Start, that's all supported, that was all supported by um, the ISP. You don't want to, um who don't want to be an instructional specialist, but you could tap that knowledge base and help these other schools that are waiting for resources. Um, there are yes. people retired from Boeing yes. and the healthcare industry and so many colleges and universities. And I think it would be fairly easy, although somebody would have to organize that to call up a really an army of people. We have an incredible group of folks who have just, um, I mentioned earlier, we have some coaches who go into classrooms or work with teachers um, who have retired and then come back into the fold to work at the ISP. So yes, I would love to at the, you know, when we finish up, if there are folks that you know are interested, we have an incredible, we're positioned at the university. So we have incredible access for folks who've been coming to us who are interested um, in engaging in this work. Um, so yes, we'd love to have folks who are interested to be and join part of the effort. Yes. Right, so uh, this lady uh, was going in a similar direction to my question, and that is that, and I think about this in a lot of different ways, but the St. Louis region has such a remarkable base of colleges and universities. Yeah that have so many gifts to offer, mm -hmm. particularly to elementary education. Mm -hmm. And the first time I learned about this program, the question came to mind is like, well, you know, this is terrific, but we have St. Louis University, we have the University of Missouri, St. Louis, 
we have all of the smaller schools that have such a, a source of education teaching opportunities that the very first time I heard about this, I thought, well, why not bring all those colleges and universities together with a higher level of partnership? Mm -hmm. And so you could then direct your, what you all have already created, you could direct that to many more schools in the whole region. And then even talking about what the state of Missouri, what our legislature does in their definition of education, but what about taking what you all have yeah. created and share it across the state? I think if we had a greater base of education from universities like Washington University and the cities, um, the universities in cities like Kansas City and mm -hmm. Springfield, mm -hmm. to bring that all together, yeah. I think we would have a better opportunity to go to that legislature and say, look, this is what we want education to be in the state of Missouri, because I don't think we're going to accomplish it with Washington University doing this in a solo kind of position. And maybe you're going to respond to me and say, well, Suzanne, we've already got this. No, no, no. I, <laughs> no, I think that you are absolutely correct. And um, I would encourage you all to go. And I don't know if you know the website. I'm not to put you on the spot. But it's so WashU is doing just that. It's a partnership. It's called the Research Practice Partnership. It's um, it, I can't I don't know the website, but it is a it's it's a host of researchers, practitioners from SLU, like from SLU, from WashU. Um, there's some other um, nonprofits and think tanks that are involved that are approach doing just that. Um, there are lots of resources in the community, and bringing everybody together is part of what the Research Practice Partnership does. It's complex though. Um, the challenges for St. Louis are unique. We are, yes, there are challenges, but we are a very um, segregated community and what's happening for some schools maybe in South City aren't the same things that are happening for some schools in North County. And the, uh, the response may need to be centered around what's best for that community. It's why we focus so heavily or so, so much on the human-centered design approach that's focused on inquiry-based, appreciative inquiry, because we want to know what this school is looking for. We want to know what this community needs. And then it's those, it's the university that can help connect to resources across a broad level that allows us to reach every single school where they are. There are definitely common, common needs that are happening, common outcomes that are happening for our schools how schools got there and the needs of those schools may differ from district to district or school to school because our communities are a bit different. Thank you all so much. It was really a pleasure to be here. What's that? Oh. <laughs>